Tucson Festival of Books and The Nation magazine, A Conversation with Chomsky. The interlocutor for tonight's event is John Nichols. He is the Washington correspondent for The Nation. He writes The Beat. He's also a contributing writer to The Progressive and In These Times. And from his home base in Madison, Wisconsin, he is the associate editor of Capital Times. He has been written in the New York Times, the Chicago Tribune. He appears regularly on radio and television. He's been in many documentaries, uh, including The Hot Wire uh, with uh, Barbara Koppel, uh, which will be filmed tonight at the Loft Theater. And Barbara Koppel, uh, Oscar-winning director, and John Nichols from The Nation will be uh, discussing uh, that documentary. Um, John Nichols has written extensively on media, politics, and money, sometimes separately, but usually uh, those go together, including his most uh, recent book, Dollarocracy, How Money and the Media uh, Electoral Complex Are Destroying America. And um, please join me in welcoming John Nichols. And now it's a pleasure to welcome back to Tucson, Professor Noam Chomsky. <laughs> Professor Chomsky, Professor Emeritus, at MIT, the founding father of linguistics, and a person that if you are in any way involved in the behavioral sciences, you know uh, who he is. He has in influenced mathematics, computer science, the other languages, psychology, cognitive science, the author of over 100 books, countless articles, and America's foremost public intellectual, a man who is spreads political dissent left and right, a self-described libertarian socialist and anarchist, a critic of US foreign policy, and someone who stands for justice, Professor Noam Chomsky. Okay. have a slight advantage in that, well, maybe a disadvantage. You can see us. We can't see you as quite as well. Uh, but I can tell that you're all beautiful. <laughs> and I also sense the, your enthusiasm about the evening we're going to have or the afternoon. Uh, when The Nation magazine was thinking about the events that we were going to do to mark our 150th anniversary, we, we knew we wanted to do something with somebody who'd been around for at least half the magazine's <laughs> life. <laughs> and, and we also knew, so we, we were hoping we would have been right for that whole period of time. And so we were stuck with Noam Chomsky. <laughs> and, and we also knew we didn't want to do the event in New York or Washington, because the genius of Noam Chomsky is that for decades, he has traveled to every corner of the United States and to every corner of the world to be where activists and people are standing up for economic and social justice and peace. And so we decided that if there was any place that needed some Chomsky, it was probably Arizona. 
So here we are. Thank you to the dean and to the school and to the university. Thank you to the Tucson Festival of Books. And thank you to Noam Chomsky, who was in South America until yesterday, just flew in from Buenos Aires. Uh, and it's a remarkable credit to this man that he, when he could maybe relax a little, he seems to be running faster and harder than ever. And I noticed when you walked out, no, uh, I flashed on something that, that I think many people in the room will know about, but not everybody. Almost 50 years ago, you debated William F. Buckley on public television, on national TV, nationwide, about issues of war and peace and you know, a, the state, propaganda, so many issues. And uh, just like this, sitting like this, debating at, on national television. And it struck me, I haven't seen you a lot on national television since. <laughs> but it's perhaps a good way to begin, because the fact of the matter is, you are, and I don't think it's news, you are America's, the world's, I would argue, leading public intellectual, and yet you are rarely seen on television, our main vehicle of communications in the United States. Why is that? Actually, uh, every once in a while I'm on Fox News. I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but one of my great honors that I'm most proud of is that uh, National Public Radio has a prime time program, all things considered. You know, their big program in the afternoon. The, uh, the co-host actually uh, is on record as saying, I'm one of the people he will never permit on that program. Really? <laughs> yeah. Well, no small accomplishment. Yeah. But, uh, but I'll still go deeper because the fact of the matter is, as somebody who's been involved for a long time in, in media reform efforts and efforts to, to kind of tackle the many challenges of American media, we have an incredibly narrow discourse in our major media in this country. And, and it is a discourse that does, in fact, move all sorts of folks out to the margins and, and does not cover movements. Does it? Doesn't cover movements, doesn't cover what's really happening a lot on the ground. And I think, in many senses, that disempowers folks because they are, they're never told about what all is happening or the ideas that are in play. There's uh, actually the most interesting uh, media, in my opinion, are what are called the liberal media. Uh, they, in fact, most of my own writing and discussion analysis is about them. Uh, they kind of set the limits. They say you can go this far and not a millimeter farther. And that's true pretty much around the world. Uh, the, uh, uh, and it, of course it does cut out uh, popular movements, popular activism, uh, very occasionally something will break through if uh, Zuccotti Park uh, mm -hmm. finally broke through slightly with some, with actually better coverage than I expected for a while. But uh, g generally the idea that uh, people might get together, uh, organize, act, to uh, change the world, that's frightening. That's like uh, some small country deciding to go off on an independent course. That's quite dangerous. And, and when that does happen, how does media, you, you mentioned coverage of Occupy, and, and in fact we had a brief period, I think in 2011, where there were uh, great popular uprisings in a lot of capitals around the United States, labor movement seeming to be out there. And, and how does media, how does so much of our media, and our liberal media, shut that down? What is, what's, the, what's the strategy, what's the tactic that you see? I think, um, actually I think it was pretty well described by George Orwell. Mm -hmm. uh, he uh, didn't say much about it, but uh, everyone here I'm sure has read Animal Farm, mm -hmm. but probably very few people have read the introduction to Animal Farm. The reason is it wasn't published. Uh, <laughs> it, was, uh, it was discovered about 30 years later in his unpublished papers. And today, if you get a, uh, a new edition of Animal Farm, you might find it there. Uh, the introduction is kind of interesting. He basically says, uh, what you all know, that uh, the book is a critical, satiric analysis of the totalitarian enemy. 
Uh, but then he says, he addresses himself to the people of free England. He says, you shouldn't feel too self-righteous. He said, in England, a free country, uh, I'm virtually quoting, uh, unpopular ideas can be suppressed without the use of force. Mm -hmm. And he goes on to give some examples and really just a couple of comment, uh, sentences of explanation, which are to the point. Uh, one uh, reason, he says, is the press is owned by wealthy men who have every reason not to want certain ideas to be expressed. Uh, and the other, he says, is, well, he says essentially it's a good education. If you have a good education, you've gone to the best schools, uh, you have uh, internalized the understanding that there are certain things it just wouldn't do to say. And I think we can add to that, it wouldn't do to think. And that's a powerful mechanism. So there are things you just don't think and you don't say. That's uh, the result of uh, effective education, effective indoctrination. Uh, people, many people don't, uh, don't uh, uh, succumb to it. Uh, what happens to them? Well, I'll tell you a story. I, I was in Sweden a couple of years ago, and uh, I noticed that uh, taxi drivers were being very friendly, uh, much more than I expected. And finally, I asked one of them, you know, why? Why is everyone being so nice? He pulled out a T-shirt that he said every taxi driver has, and the T-shirt had a picture of me and a, a quote in Swedish of something I had said once when I was asked, what happens to people of independent mind? And I said, they become taxi drivers. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that is good. <laughs> See, now, if you could get a quote like that for every industry, yeah. <laughs> you'd rule the world. Yeah. Well, this gets, this gets to a, a deeper question, though, because it's clear in the United States today, and you see it, you travel in, an incredible amount around this country, and you see the movements that are there, immigrant rights, mm -hmm. Black Lives Matter, get rid of Citizens United, get money out of politics, labor struggles, all, all sorts of things that, that, that are there. So many movements and yet not enough coalescence, not something coming together there. And, and I wonder if the, the lack of, of that cohesive center, that's a place where people can get their information in some sort of steady way, if that has a role in creating a situation where we're sort of, we're compartmentalized, we're I think, often neglected and disrespected, and it, it has an actual political impact. Yeah, it's even worse than that. Uh, I've lived in Boston for, uh, since 1950, but I go to sections of Boston for talks and discover that there's very significant activism going on in that neighborhood that people don't know of in the next neighborhood where they're doing similar things. A part of the reason is simply the absence of a labor movement. Uh, throughout history, the labor movement has been, with all of its defects and deficiencies and limits, it's been a kind of a center around which things coalesce. Uh, in, in other countries, when I, when I give talks, uh, even countries like England, uh, the talks are often in uh, labor movement centers, uh, union centers. Not in the United States. Very rare. You can talk to uh, labor activists, but somewhere else, in a church or in a university, uh, the few institutions that exist. But uh, there has been a great success in the United States. Uh, the United States is, to an unusual extent, a business-run society. That goes way back mm -hmm. to the early days for all kinds of reasons. And the, it has a very violent and repressive labor history. Uh, workers were being murdered in the United States by the hundreds at a time when nothing like that was taking place in Europe or Australia or other places. And repeatedly, the labor movement has simply been crushed. It's revived again, uh, and when it did revive, it was a center around which activism uh, uh, coalesced. It had its own journals. Uh, as late as the, in, in the late 19th century, the 
The labor press was very lively, active, widely read. Uh, in the, as late as the 1950s, there were still about uh, maybe 800 labor journals that were reaching maybe 30 million people uh, a week, you know. Uh, all of that has succumbed to the uh, a massive attack of concentrated capital. Uh, you're seeing it right now pretty dramatically right where you live. In Wisconsin. And yeah. uh, Scott Walker, our, our yeah. great uh, and the, contribution to the American political process. Well, and the success of, right. <laughs> Uh, even the rhetoric is pretty remarkable. Like take uh, the right, so-called right to work yeah. law that just passed. You, you are in a right to work state. Yeah, right to work means right to scrounge. Mm -hmm. Has nothing to do with right to work. Uh, uh, it means the right to be represented by a union to defend you and not to pay for it. Mm -hmm. That's right to work. So it's a right to scrounge law, but it's not described that way and it's not interpreted that way. This is one part of a huge, uh, the, the, uh, during the, in the 1920s, the labor had been virtually crushed. Uh, one of the great uh, uh, works of uh, labor history is called, I think, something like The Fall of the House of Labor, referring to the 1920s, David Montgomery. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, visitors from uh, Europe and uh, Australia were shocked to see the weakness and the uh, of the labor movement and its uh, uh, the ability to denounce, condemn, and destroy it. Well, the 1930s it it arose again. CIO organizing, uh, a lot of labor activism uh, during the Second World War, the Depression and the Second World War. There was a real wave of radical democracy that spread all over much of the world including the United States. And it led to a very quick backlash uh, in many ways. Uh, so for example, in Europe, as uh, US and British troops finally began to enter the, the European continent late in the war, uh, moving up through Italy, the first thing they had to do was to disperse the anti-fascist resistance uh, to restore traditional order, including fascist collaborators. As they reached northern Italy, they were appalled to discover that uh, a, a, the, labor, the, la the, the resistance, the partisan resistance, and uh, the, had, had developed a functioning society with uh, mm -hmm. uh, worker management, worker ownership. Uh, this incidentally was the time of the British Labor Party, and they were appalled to discover that there were enterprises without managers and owners. Uh, all of that had to be dismantled. Uh, same in Greece, uh, same thing, and it was a very brutal war. It cost, killed hundreds of thousands of people, and so on all through Europe. But the same happened here, immediately, not with that much violence, but immediately after the war, 1947, came the Taft-Hartley Act, uh, uh, undermining basic labor rights, organizing rights, secondary boycotts, and so on. Uh, shortly after, a huge campaign began of corporate propaganda, which is pretty remarkable in scale. Uh, there's pretty good scholarship on it, like Elizabeth von Wolf's book. Uh, the, the, the concentrated capital was uh, penetrating uh, churches, schools, uh, clubs, uh, of course. Uh, education. Edu yeah, edu education was, and, uh, uh, it, and began a massive attack on labor. Well, I mean, the labor unions are not faultless in this. Uh, there was a, uh, a, the radical militant element of the labor movement was eliminated. That was the, uh, uh, under the, within the context of Cold War propaganda, you know, communist. The left uh, CIO unions. And so on, yeah. So they were crushed, and the labor leadership accepted that. And furthermore, they entered into a kind of class collaboration. Uh, the, uh, it's kind of interesting to compare the same union in the United States and Canada, like say UAW in the United States and Canada, same union, acted quite differently. Uh, one reason why Canada has national health care and the United States doesn't is that in Canada, the labor movements militantly advocated for national health care. 
In the United States, the same unions uh, militantly advocated for good health care for themselves. So the uh, auto workers did have decent health care with a compact with management. Now, a compact with management is a devil's choice <laughs> because management can decide at any time it's over. And as you recall, it was pretty striking and uh, must have been 1979 or so. The Doug Fraser, head of UAW, said, pulled out of a labor um, uh, uh, enter uh, management um, cooperative enterprise saying that he's discovered that uh, capital is fighting a one-sided class war against the labor movement. Mm -hmm. Big discovery. It so that's took a while. Their, yeah, it took a while, but by that time it was pretty late. But that, and, that war has really stepped up in the last few years, especially in the last few years where we've seen, you know, right to work at one time, you know, was, it was Arizona got to be right to work and, and a lot of southern states, but it didn't move north. Now we have Michigan becoming a right to work state, Indiana, Great Steel Center becoming a right to work state. Wisconsin, the center of American progressivism, becoming a right-to-work state, public sector unions being busted down, losing collective bargaining rights. I mean, this is a very aggressive, concentrated initiative that's happening right now. Happening right now, and why? it goes back to the 1940s. Now, it's history, but, but why now so, why well, does it all come now? Well, what actually, if you look at the last you know, period since the Second World War, the counterattack against labor, uh, popular democracy, uh, began immediately. It was held back for 20 years by a number of factors. One was the strong appeal of the New Deal measures, which a, wa a large part of the population strongly supported. Uh, you may recall that Eisenhower said that uh, anyone who questions the legitimacy of New Deal programs is crazy. He's a nut. Yeah. Is not, I mean, Eisenhower today would be way out on the left of the political spectrum. Yeah. But, uh, well, but, your buddy uh, Howard Zinn uh, would occasionally say that, you know, in many ways, Eisenhower was a, a pretty impressive president because he didn't send troops to the Middle East, but he did send them to Arkansas. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Actually, he did send them to the Middle East. I realize. I mean, <laughs> we're going to get to the rest of the world yeah, in a minute. But, yeah. But uh, it, uh, through the 50s and the 60s, there uh, there was the uh, remaining powerful appeal of the New Deal measures. There still was a labor movement. Also, these were periods, a period of very high growth, uh, mostly based on the state sector of the economy, which you're not supposed to know. But, uh, that, uh, but, but it was high growth. This is sometimes called the golden age of American capitalism. And it was egalitarian growth. So the lowest quintile did about as well as the highest quintile. Furthermore, capital was regulated, very crucial. And taxed. The, the wealthy the, were taxed. The wealthy reason. were taxed, but capital was regulated. Banks were banks. Banks were places where you could you know, put your money in, they'd lend them to somebody to buy a car or something. Not like today. This system broke down in the early 70s. Uh, the, uh, uh, and that had a major effect. In fact, there were, there were no financial crises in the 50s and the 60s because the regulatory system was intact. Internationally, the Bretton Woods system of regulated capital was intact. That was dismantled in the early 70s. You begin to get what has become the global neoliberal assault on the global population everywhere, mm -hmm. taking one or another form. In the United States, it's... Uh, the form that it's taken is an increasing attack on the general population, including the labor movement. So, for example, for most of the population in the past, uh, since, say, mid-70s, es escalating under Reagan, continue under Clinton and on, uh, uh, for most of the population, uh, real wages have stagnated or declined. For, for male workers today, real wages are about what they were in 1968. There's been growth, but it's going to very few pockets, mm -hmm. narrower and narrower. And uh, this has had a, a striking and dramatic effect, even on things like popular opinion. Mm -hmm. So take um, the last couple of years, you know, Obama's 
kind of major uh, initiative was the Affordable Care Act. And it's interesting to look at public attitudes towards it and to look back at the past. This is a very heavily polled country. We know a lot about people's attitudes. Uh, ever since the 1940s, there's been strong support for national health care. Uh, polls depend a little bit on how the questions act asked, but it's often a large majority, uh, very substantial. Uh, as late as the late 1980s, uh, about uh, a majority of the population thought that there ought to be a constitutional guarantee for health care. And actually about 40% of the population thought it was in the Constitution. That's not that long ago. Well, when you, you get, take Obama, when Obama's initiative began, uh, about for almost two thirds of the population supported a public option, mm -hmm. meaning of the various options you could choose, one would be essentially Medicare, you know, public national health care. That wasn't even mentioned. It was, wasn't even proposed. It jettisoned it right away, uh, uh, along with single payer, which was what we should have done. Yeah. Uh, the other, uh, uh, one of the strange, maybe unique features of the U.S. healthcare system is that the government is not permitted by law to negotiate drug prices. Mm -hmm. uh, the VA is, so drug prices are lower there. Uh, the Pentagon can negotiate uh, prices for paper clips, let's say but the government cannot negotiate, say, for Medicare and Medicaid drug prices. So, of course, they're out of sight. Uh, Obama never even tried to touch this, even though 85% of the population are opposed to it. Now, and if you look at the following years, the propaganda has so changed people's expressed attitudes, whatever their actual attitudes are, that. Uh, uh, even the mild reforms of the uh, Affordable Care Act, which are some kind of a step forward, they don't really deal with the problem. Uh, even those are opposed. And you think that in not that many years ago, like 1990, 40% uh, of the population thought there was a, a constitutional guarantee for public health care. This is a tremendous triumph of propaganda. And we've created a system now where it is so easy to flood so much money into the communication process, Citizens United, McCutcheon, all these decisions of the courts, which whatever minimal barriers are now down, that you, know, you hear the Koch brothers planning to spend close to a billion dollars in the next election, then you find out they spend hundreds of millions to do, to do just these things, yeah. to take apart. And some of the things that have been done are, are really sophisticated. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, uh, there's an interesting study by uh, Suzanne Mettler, Cornell University, a sociologist, called The Submerged State. Mm -hmm. And what she shows pretty convincingly is that there's been a change from visible government programs of reform and, uh, subsist and uh, subsidy and support, where you see that the government is doing something for you, to indirect means which, where you don't see that the government is doing it. What you see is some private entity doing it, which is being subsidized by the government. Mm -hmm. And the end result is that people think the government is not, is harming them, it's not helping them. And of course, as these, as this submerged state develops, turns out most of the subsidy is going to the wealthy. Uh, so for example, the uh, um, uh, home mortgage interest uh, deduction, mm -hmm. which is a very substantial sum of money, Overwhelmingly, it goes to the wealthy. Uh, in the uh, uh, education, the, the, uh, the, the for-profit educational system, which is a big thing here, uh, most of it, most of the funding comes from the taxpayer, but you don't see it, you know. And of course, it's going to the corporations, That's not the, the you know. And there's uh, devices like that all across the country. The result is that uh, if some strange results. Uh, people who are most subsidized by the government tend to be most opposed to government subsidy. Uh, so uh, 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 it's very oh, striking. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do they not know they are subsidized or are they just you know, cynical? You don't know. They do not Bec know. I mean, who would know that uh, a tax deduction for employer uh, uh, health insurance is a huge subsidy to the corporations? or that the home mortgage 
deduction is a subsidy to the wealthy. I mean, you can figure it out if you think about it, but it's not obvious on the surface. And that goes case by case. So in this terrific new book from Haymarket Books, uh, Noam Chomsky, Masters of Mankind, which uh, Glenn Greenwald says, on the cover, Glenn Greenwald says, there is no living political writer who has more radically changed how more people think in more parts of the world about political issues than Noam Chomsky, which is kind of nice. Uh, but I'm not trying to... You have me. to realize that he's a friend. And you he always is a friend. I, know, I realize. And I say nice things about him. You too. say it back and forth. It's wonderful. <laughs> we are at a book festival, so some people are aware of blurbs on books. But yeah. Yeah, I have the sense that Glenn probably means it. And I also, it, this is a collection of essays. And one of the interesting things is, it, for a variety of reasons, my favorite one, and it was an essay that you wrote some years ago titled Consent Without Consent. And um, I think that comes a lot of what we're talking about with the submerged state, but also this notion that an awfully lot of what's happening when you assault labor, when you assault, so my, many of the, the vehicles by which people might organize, might push back, it's really an assault on democracy itself. Well, democracy has, democracy is a threat to any power system. It doesn't matter what it is. I mean, uh, for, pretty, um, for pretty obvious reasons. So yes, there is a, the, uh, the general assault on the population includes a major assault on democracy. And what's happened in the United States is extremely revealing. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, one of the main topics in mainstream academic politi uh, political science is study of comparison between public attitudes and public policy, uh, which is a pretty straightforward uh, inquiry. We see public policy. Uh, uh, there's extensive polls, they're pretty reliable, they're consistent over time, so you get a pretty good sense of public attitudes. Uh, and the results are, are quite intriguing. Uh, by now, uh, about 70% of the population is literally disenfranchised. They're the lower 70% on the income wealth scale. Uh, the, their political representatives simply pay no attention to them, so it doesn't matter what they think. As you move up the scale, you get a little bit more influence when you get to the very top policies made. Yeah. Uh, that correlates very... Uh, the, uh, one of the major students of political participation, Walter Dean Burnham, years ago, pointed out that if you look at the non-voting uh, non in the United States is very high. He said if you look at the non-voters and their kind of demographics, and compare it with Europe, uh, they are the people who in Europe would vote for some laborite or social democratic party. But since no such thing exists here, they don't vote. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe they, don't, they, don't, they may not need read uh, academic political science, but they know that nobody's paying attention to them, so why bother voting? Mm -hmm. uh, this is a plutocracy, it's not a democracy. And the effects are pretty striking. There was a, the last election, November 2014, was carefully analyzed by two really fine political scientists, Walter Dean Burnham and Tom Ferguson, wrote a careful analysis of it, uh, uh, voting participation. Turns out that voting participation was about at the level of 1830. Well, it was also, it was 36%. But if, if you compare it state by state. But what was interesting was it was the lowest since, Since 1942. It's worse than that. Yeah. Take a look at their analysis, mm -hmm. state by state. It's about 1830. Mm -hmm. That was a time when voting was restricted to propertied white males. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and this has been declining. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, by now, most people, as they point out, just don't bother. Yeah. It's, uh, well, and in fact, we, when we flood so much money into politics, and so much of it goes to pay for negative ads on television. One side saying, don't vote for this guy. One side saying, don't vote for that guy. A lot of people make the logical choice. And don't vote for either. And, but the, the interesting result on that, the interesting result on that is that you, you do have one entity that comes out getting really rich by this politics that drives so many of the people away, and that is the, the big broadcast companies. They make a fortune. They do, and uh, 
but uh, not in any way, I think, advancing democracy. Well, but I think we, we should, I mean, what's happening now is indeed extreme, but we, we should remember that it goes it way back. It wasn't good before. Way back. Yeah, yeah. You remember about a century ago, uh, Mark Hanna, the great campaign manager, was asked, uh, what do you really need to run an effective campaign? He said, there are three things. The first one is money. The second one is money. <laughs> and, and the third, he said, I can't remember. <laughs> that was not around 1900. You know. and, but, but there was sort of some interventions between 1900 and now. We sort of tried to changes. address some of those problems. There were changes. And now yes. we are. Now we're going ba back. In fact, it's worse than it was probably ever. Is it, now, that's an important thing. We should, do you think that it is worse, that we are maybe at the worst point now? Is it, or are there, when we look through the history of this country? Well, it's, it's a mixed story because there is plenty of political activism. And in fact, if you look at people's attitudes closely, they tend to be pretty social democratic. Mm -hmm. uh, even, uh, you know, there have been studies of people, the, the s subclass of people who say, you know, get the government off my back, I don't want to have government, and so on. You take a look at them. What they want is more spending on health care, more spending on education, higher taxes on the wealthy, uh, a range of positions which uh, you and I would probably agree with. But they're the ones who say, you know, they're that get the government off our back. We don't want any don't, government. I don't want the no. government yeah. messing with my Medicare. Yeah, don't mess with my Medicare, yeah, yeah. that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Hey, we have this, uh, we've got this, Wonderful group of folks. They are actually uh, graduates of this university who started a, a little company here to democratize how we do Q and A, how we, we actually talk. Good. And um, it's, the, it's yeah. they, I know how it works. Well, yeah. The amount of money you put in determines which. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, no. It's actually. <laughs> that's the next application. <laughs> These guys, they call it Two Shoes App, and it's. Um, as in goody two-shoes, like the person who raises their hand. And they, they, they actually created something that you featured it on your Facebook site or someplace where, well, you, I, don't I know, have, somebody, I don't have a Facebook somebody who does something someplace. <laughs> somebody with, puts with up a Chomsky Facebook. Yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's like the person who made the t-shirt in Sweden. Um, they, they asked you know, what, what we could ask you. And uh, the two-shoes app folks came up with all these. And it was very interesting that a lot of the questions the hopeful questions actually focused on things going on outside the United States, which I find frustrating because I do believe there's a lot of great activism here. But there was there questions, especially about Greece and Spain, hmm. and particularly about the rise of Syriza and the rise of Podemos, both political parties that did not exist or political groupings that did not exist, but in Greece have now risen to being the governing party and potentially in Spain could do so. You've been watching these closely. Very closely. And I'm very interested. First off, your general impressions, and many people ask questions about this, but also your sense of why they are coming together and functioning politically and, and something happening that we are still waiting for in the U.S. Actually, I've just been at an international conference in uh, Buenos Aires, that's where it was yesterday, of uh, an international forum of, uh, on emancipation and inequality where it drew groups like this from all over the world, Podemos, activists and leaders were there, serious activists and so on. And you were very impressed by the Podemos. Uh, they're pretty impressive, yeah. And, but we have to remember what's been happening in Europe. Uh, Europe has had uh, uh, one of the great successes of Europe in the post-Second World War era has been to construct a mod reasonably well-functioning uh, uh, social democratic uh, welfare state society. A lot of problems, but but by comparative standards, pretty successful. During the nightmarish circumstance of Norway. Oh, that's a, yeah. But all over the continent. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, the business classes hate it. You know. And uh, Europe has been subjected to uh, an extreme form of punishment in the past few years, uh, it's, which is an attack on democracy, an attack on living standards, and an effort to undermine and dismantle this achievement. And it's pretty, it's the, the policies that have been followed are uh, policies of austerity during recession. 
which even the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, says is economically ridiculous. But it's, it may be economically ridiculous, but it's politically and socially sensible. It's from the point of view, from the point of view of class war. It is slowly achieving a result which has long been uh, hoped for by the ruling sections, by the dominant sections of capital. But it's very severe, and it's been worse. The worst hit have been the peripheral countries. Uh, Greece, Greece, Spain, uh, Spain Portugal, Portugal, Ireland. Ireland. Uh, what's actually happened is that the uh, the banks, you know, the northern banks, the German banks, and so on, mm -hmm. uh, made very uh, risky uh, loans to countries which were unable to sustain them. Uh, by the, when the crash came and they couldn't pay them back, uh, the big banks like other center, sectors of capital, don't believe in capitalism. If you, in a capitalist system, it, say if I lend you money, and I know that you're a, a risky borrower, so yeah, I yeah. put, you are, <laughs> I put heavy conditions on it, I make a lot of profit, and then you can't pay. In a capitalist system, it's my problem. Yeah. But not the way the world works. Well, that would never happen in the U.S. The banks would never <laughs> right. get bailed out here. <laughs> In fact, come to that in a moment. But what's, but the the response of the so-called troika, the European Commission, you know, the, the bank and so on, have and the IMF have been to pay back the culprits, pay the bankers. So when there's money given to Greece, what's called money to Greece means give it back to the banks that lent money to Greece and want to be repaid. Very anti-capitalist. The same thing happens here. Uh, so take, say, the big banks here. Uh, there was recently a study of the, by the IMF of the profits of the big banks in the United States. Turns out that they make virtually no profit. Uh, their profit almost entirely depends on the implicit government insurance policy. Uh, uh, the business press estimates that at over $80 billion a year. Uh, you can argue about the numbers, but it's very high. Uh, it's not just the bailouts. That's a small part of it. It's a higher cre inflated ca credit ratings, access to cheap money, the ability to make risky loans, which are profitable, knowing you're going to be bailed out. Uh, all of that amounts to quite a lot. Same in Europe. Uh, and uh, alongside of this is an attack on democracy. It's so extreme that uh, even the Wall Street Journal commented that correctly that no matter who's elected in a European country, communists, uh, right wing, whatever it may be, policies are the same. Mm -hmm. Because policies are made by the Brussels bureaucrats and the Bundesbank. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter what the public wants. And those policies are cut the pensions, austerity, make people work neoliberal attack mm -hmm. during periods of recession. Attack trade unions, yeah. attack yeah. The, and the, whole, again, the whole list. The whole list. And uh, uh, sometimes it's pretty dramatic. So. Uh, uh, right now, for example, Syriza in Greece hinted that they might undertake a referendum. The roof fell in on them. Yeah. How dare you ask the public about policies that they're being subjected to? Uh, this happened a couple of years ago when uh, Papandreou, the prime minister, suggested mildly that maybe there should be a referendum in Greece to see if they should accept these extremely harsh and savage policies that are being imposed. Again, across the spectrum, he was bitterly denounced. He had to back off this mm -hmm. idea that the public should be asked about what the policies that are being imposed on them is considered outrageous. Policies have to be made by the, the Brussels bureaucrats and the big banks. Mm -hmm. That's a major attack on democracy. Now, in reaction to this, there have been popular uprising. Uh, Podemos, the party in Spain, is just a couple of years old, but uh, the indignados, the uh, activism of young people is was quite In expensive. many ways something, not exactly because it's a different country, but in many ways something we might see as parallel to what we saw with Occupy. Occupy, very much so. Mm. But, uh, it went if on. Occupy became a political party. It went party. on in, yeah. in Spain to, to, to everyone's surprise. Nobody could have predicted this three or four years ago. But out of it came a, uh, 
political organization, which is now running ahead in the polls, could take over. Mm -hmm. uh, it, Syriza and Greece is kind of, it's pretty similar. In fact, they did take political power. Mm -hmm. But you couldn't have predicted it a couple of years ago. And there's a very uh, 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 kind of challenging and, in a way, frightening situation. Mm -hmm. If Podemos, Syriza, and similar organizations fail, the likely outcome is popular movements of the far right. Yes. Uh, that's happened before, late 20s, early 30s. Mm -hmm. We're seeing something similar. If the organized left doesn't succeed in taking control, we may very well get the organized right with horrible consequences, which we've seen before. Well, the, the great British uh, parliamentarian, Tony Benn, said that he was old enough to remember when countries around the world were essentially making the choice. Mm. And at exactly the same time, yeah. some going toward fascism, some to going toward yeah. a progressive democracy. Well, they all had the choice. Yeah. It was the same in all of them, and it depended who won. And, and, and in, obviously in Greece, that's a reality, because there is a far right oh, that yes. is very fascist. Yeah. That has certainly Spain to France, uh, yeah. England, UKIP, for example. And, and yet, so many of our political leaders in America seem to be, it, it, at the very least, disinterested or you know, at least publicly. Right. They're publicly. paying plenty of attention. No, I know they are, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but they're not, we, we hear very little discourse very about little. this among our political figures. Because it's dangerous to talk about it. You don't want people to know that it is possible for the population to become organized, active, effective, take power, take control of their fate, uh, and, and create a different society. For example, you don't hear in the United States about the fact that in Spain there's a major conglomerate which is worker-owned and which in fact survived the recession, uh, Mondragon, yeah. uh, which includes uh, uh, in manufacturing, bank, uh, finance, uh, health, uh, housing. Uh, uh, it, it's a, a huge and effective conglomerate, worker-owned, uh, worker uh, directors picked by the workers and working quite well. Uh, you don't see headlines about that. Not them. at all. And, and yet, and very cutting edge. They're actually ahead of the curve on, on developing new technologies, developing yes. new industries. And you also don't see much about the fact that something similar is happening here. Not on that scale, but uh, Garel Perovitz is one person who's written about it yeah. in areas of the old Rust Belt, as you know. Cleveland and other cities. Yeah, you know, we're in northern Ohio, other places. There's uh, the beginnings of development of uh, worker-owned enterprises, which are not, not on the Mondragon scale, but not insubstantial either. Mm -hmm. and, and Incidentally, they also get conservative support. What's that? They even get oh, yeah. conservative support. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and one of the things, one of the things that, that it struck me got remarkably little attention in the United States was when the bankers crashed the economy of Iceland, tiny little country, and then they, they basically they cut a deal that Iceland's going to pay back the banks. And then, because it was a small enough country, the people went to the president's house and said, we don't want to do this. And, and they basically forced a referendum on the issue. And amazingly enough, Iceland voted not to pay back the banks. And what's more, they did pretty well. And they've come out OK. <laughs> yeah. The, uh... <laughs> Uh, the British and or at least not to pay back were quickly. infuriated, but yeah, it yeah, worked yeah. well. Yeah. Isn't that, it's an interesting in fact, something similar happened in Argentina around 2000. Yeah. They essentially defaulted on the debt, and the economists and the uh, governments around the world said, this is, you're going to be destroy yourselves. They had practically the highest growth rate in uh, Latin America since then. They're now under attack by U.S. vulture funds, yeah. backed by the judicial system, which is very, may, may really undermine them. Actually, the, uh, the, the judge in the United States, Judge Grisa, who made the uh, ruling, uh, is requiring, demanded that Argentina pay back the vulture funds uh, without the so-called haircut, the, you know, the uh, cutting back of uh, uh, profit that they demanded. And he's now insisting that institutional like say Citibank not bought, deal with Argentine bonds because they'd be in violation of his order. Mm 
they'll be in violation of Argentine law if they don't do it. Mm -hmm. And they're caught in the midst of this conflict between the U.S. vulture funds backed so far by the U.S. judiciary and a country which uh, correctly uh, didn't pay back the money. Notice that these debts are really not legitimate debts. These are what are called in uh, odious debts. That's a concept that was invented by the United States, actually. That when the United States uh, uh, took over Cuba in 1898, it did not want to pay Cuba's debts to Spain. And the U.S. argued quite correctly that these debts were illegitimate, odious, they were called. The people of Cuba had not incurred the debt, mm -hmm. so why should they be forced to pay it? But that's true of debt all over the world. Mm -hmm. The people don't incur the debt, the rulers do. Why should the population pay? That's, uh, mm -hmm. and, and we actually, we look at the questions people have submitted, we have quite a few questions in this range, or in this area, and, and there is, again and again, keep, people come back to this, this question of how do we get how do we get folks focused on that? And Naomi Klein wrote a book, This Changes Everything, book, yeah. uh, arguing that, that perhaps, you know, torching the planet might get people interested. Um, other folks have suggested, and we have some, a number of questions on this, other folks have suggested that the decline of work, the fact that we are replacing people with robots and apps and it's harder and harder to find meaningful work, or at least work of, of a decent pay, um, that there may be issues that bring us together. What's your sense on this? Is there something that, that be it climate change, be it some sort of economic shift, that, does, that could in the United States spark a mobilization, a change? Yeah. Some? Well, you know, prediction in human affairs is a a very low probability affair. Yeah, I realize. <laughs> See, I read, for, for, I read Chomsky's good, old essays for that. Yeah. For good reasons. Yeah. I mean, uh, an awful lot depends just on will and choice. Yeah. And we don't know. Nobody knows. Uh, Podemos, for example, you couldn't have predicted. Uh, the new deal, CIO organizing in the 1930s, you couldn't have predicted. Mm -hmm. The United States could have gone towards fascism. Could have. Uh, these are questions of people's choice and decisions. Now take Naomi Klein's point. Uh, whether she's going to be right or wrong, we don't know. But if she's wrong, we're doomed. Well, there's a tough part. And yeah. uh, we are coming towards a precipice. Unless you've been living under a rock, you know that uh, the threat of environmental catastrophe is quite real and not in the very distant future. Uh, maybe the next generation could be extremely serious. Uh, we also can see that the race towards disaster is uh, being carried out with almost uh, euphoric intensity. Uh, take a look at this morning's Wall Street Journal lead article. Mm -hmm. Top article is about how uh, the oil, the energy corporations in the U.S. are uh, facing, there's, there's an oil glut at the moment, mm -hmm. and they're preparing right now that if uh, oil, uh, this declines, they'll immediately put into motion uh, 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 enterprises they've already established which will greatly increase the flow of oil. In other words, drive us farther toward the precipice. We're racing towards this. And, and what Naomi Klein is pointing out is uh, we'd better organize to stop it or else uh, the prospects for decent existence are going to disappear. Now, will it work or won't it? Well, that's a matter of will and choice. These folks got to decide. And take the question of work. Yeah. It's an interesting question. Take, look around the country. Uh, this country is falling apart. Mm -hmm. uh, when you come back, from, even when you come back from Argentina to the United States, it looks like a third world country. When you come back from Europe, even more so, the uh, infrastructure's collapsing, Nothing works, the transportation system doesn't work, the health system is a total scandal, twice the per capita cost of other countries and not very good outcomes. Point by point, the schools are declining, they don't have enough teachers. There's a huge amount of work to be done. There are plenty of idle hands who want to do it. There's ample resources, mm 
but the system is so corrupt that it cannot put together massive resources, idle hands, and needed work. Mm -hmm. uh, that can be overcome. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the extent of this is really astonishing. So take, say, transportation. Uh, now you can take a high-speed train from Beijing to Kazakhstan. You can't take one from Boston to New York. That's the most, the most heavily traveled corridor, I suppose, in the world is Boston to yeah. Washington. Yeah. It's about the way it was 60 years ago. The first time I took a train from New York, Philadelphia to uh, Boston, 1950. Uh, I think t if I take the Acela, the fast train today, I think it's maybe 15 minutes faster. It's go it, as it goes along the Connecticut Turnpike, it's not keeping up with the cars, uh, <laughs> literally. I mean, a, a couple of years ago, I was, in, I was giving talks in Europe. I ended up in southern France, and I had to take a train from Avignon, southern France, to the de Gaulle Airport in Paris. There happens to be a direct train, not surprisingly. Uh, it took, it's about the distance from Washington to Boston. It took two hours. Boston to Washington is like seven hours. Uh, and this is just symptomatic well, of what's happening to the country. I'm sure an election between Hillary Clinton and, and Jeb Bush would sort this all out. Though. Oh, right, right. <laughs> well, they have private jets. <laughs> they have private jets, it doesn't matter. I, you, you are a, and there's so many things to, to bring in here and, and discuss. We've been bouncing a little bit on, on the rest of the world. Before we come back into U.S. politics for a second, I, I would be remiss if I didn't note that on Tuesday, Israel is going to have an election. And uh, the Prime Minister of Israel recently visited the United States uh, to give our Congress some advice. Um, <laughs> Which, intriguingly enough, if you read the polls, may not have helped him in Israel, in fact. Uh, but give us a sense of, uh, the, as we look at the Netanyahu visit, and then also the play out with our 47 Republican senators who have just decided to become diplomats. Actually, there was an interesting article on the uh, Netanyahu speech to Congress by uh, Uri Avneri. He's one of the One of the great smartest. thinkers in Israel. Yeah. Uh, really fine Israeli intellectuals and activists. He's a little older than me. And he started, believe it or not, he's yeah. still old. <laughs> he, uh, he started the article by saying that when he was watching Netanyahu in Congress, it reminded him of something. And he had to think to th what it was reminding him of. Uh, finally, he, it dawned on him. It was Hitler's speeches to the Reichstag. He said all that was missing was Heil. You know. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was quite a... Mm -hmm. It was quite a performance. It was a really demeaning performance. And it's a combination of a number of factors. Uh, one factor is uh, just, as you mentioned before, money. A ton of money goes into funding uh, 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 congressmen who will support the latest uh, uh, APAC line. Another part is evangelical Christians. Mm -hmm. There's a, the base of the, a large part of the base of the Republican Party now, these are Republicans mostly, is uh, evangelical Christians who succeed in combining almost ex extreme support for Israel with extreme anti-Semitism. It's an interesting combination. I mean, if you look at their theology, the theology of a large number of them, the idea is that uh, There'll be a great war between Israel and its enemies. It'll end up at Armageddon. Everyone will kill each other. The uh, saved souls will rise to heaven. The rest go to Won't eternal so damnation, yeah, yeah. which includes virtually all the Jews. 160,000, for some reason, will be saved. They will have found Christ in time. Now, you can't get more anti-Semitic than that. Uh, even <laughs> Hitler didn't go that far. But this, this is combined with uh, uh, what's called support for Israel to such an extreme extent that the Israeli government has to try to control it. They have to try to prevent people from blowing up the Temple Mount, you know, to create the war which will uh, uh, lead to Armageddon. And this is pretty broad in the United States. Actually, something like that even included 
uh, uh, President Bush, second President Bush, uh, this is perhaps you know, when, uh, when Bush was uh, trying to gain uh, international support for the invasion of Iraq, uh, he met the French president, Chirac, and uh, uh, he, uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you how I learned about this and then tell you what the story is. Uh, around that time, I got a letter from a Belgian theologian who sent me a disquisition that he wrote on a very obscure passage in the book of Ezekiel about uh, uh, Gog and Magog coming and doing terrible things to Israel. Nobody knows what it means. Are they people? Are they places? It's just a very obscure passage. But in uh, even an ex ex a, ver a stream of evangelical theology, this means an evil force will come from the north attack Israel, lead to Armageddon, then all these things happen. Well, what happened with Bush and Chirac? Bush apparently started, this is January 2003, right before the war, uh, uh, telling, he went off and started talking to Chirac about Gog and Magog. Chirac didn't know what the heck he was talking about. Yeah, sure. So he asked the uh, Elysee, the French Foreign Office, what's this guy raving about? They didn't know. So they contacted this Belgian theologian who explained them what it's about. Hmm. Uh, I learned about this at the time, but I didn't believe a word of it, so I never wrote about it. But I did mention it to an Australian uh, academic a researcher, Clive Hamilton, and he looked into it, and it's true. Hmm. It, it shows up in the French biographies of Chirac. Hmm. Well, this, this tells us that, you know, Speaking of the dangers we face, our fate is sometimes in the hands of people who are, by any rational standards, <laughs> hard to believe. <laughs> and it's not the only case. Actually, Reagan talked about Russia as Gog and Mongo. Well, we, we, may, uh, we, we seem to be having a little trouble in our relations with Russia right now. It's serious trouble. Yeah. And it's... Uh, it's a complex story. It goes back to 1990, when the around then when the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, there was a, an agreement made between uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, Russian leader, and uh, George Bush the first. The, the first, you know, the, he George was George Bush the greater time. versus George Bush the, the lesser, the statesmanlike yeah. Bush the first. Yeah, you know, uh, they agree, uh, Gorbachev agreed to allow. Germany to be reunited and to join NATO, hostile military alliance. It's quite a concession if you look at the history of the pre preceding history of the century. Germany alone had practically destroyed Russia several times, and he was agreeing to allow a united Germany to join a hostile military alliance. There was a quid pro quo. The, uh, this would, the, it was, the phrase that was used was, that NATO would not expand one inch to the east, which meant East Germany. That was the agreement. And NATO immediately expanded to East Germany. Uh, Gorbachev complained, naturally, and he was informed that this was only a verbal agreement. It wasn't on paper. Uh, the unstated implication, I'll add it, not them, is if you're naive enough to make a gentleman's agreement with us, it's your problem. You know? <laughs> not not and, ours. <laughs> not ours. Uh, Clinton came along, expanded NATO further, uh, right to the borders of Russia. Uh, the uh, current issue over Ukraine is in a region of g enormous geostrategic significance to Russia. It's right at the heart of Russian concerns. Any Russian leader would not accept uh, Ukraine joining NATO. Even joining the European Union is problematic for them. It's it's kind of like Mexico joining the Warsaw Pact mm -hmm. in the in, in the in 1970s or 1980s. You know, uh, we'd go, we'd have a nuclear war to block, block that. Uh, and in fact, the new Europe, Ukrainian government, the one that came in after the coup, has voted. The parliament voted uh, overwhelmingly, something like 300 to 10 or something, to join. The, take steps toward joining NATO. That's a serious threat to Russia. 
I mean, whatever you think about Russian actions, think, you know, however horrible you believe them, mm -hmm. this is a real strategic threat. Now there's a solution, and everyone knows what it is. Declare Ukrainian neutrality. Ukraine should be neutral, not part of any military alliance. Uh, there has to be a settlement about autonomy, and which is not a trivial issue, uh, but can be solved. That could, so that could prevent what could be escalation up to the level of nuclear war. It's very serious. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take much to set off a war. Small things can set off a war, we know that. Look back one century and you see an example, but there are plenty of them since. This is really playing with fire. And it makes no sense to press a nuclear armed state to the limit where it might react violently. That's, uh, you know, that's saying let's commit suicide. It literally is. I mean, it's been known for a long time that there is absolutely no escape from nuclear war. None. You cannot have a limited nuclear war among major powers. Uh, back in 1962, at the mm -hmm. time of the missile crisis, which came very close, there were war games run in Washington. They all showed that any limited war is going to explode to a total war. Is, uh, do you have any, and we had a couple of questions, do you have any optimism as regards the uh, U.S. negotiations with Iran, as regards nuclear power, or well, nuclear this, weapons? Yeah. This is an interesting it's interesting the way it's discussed here. Uh, first of all, the, the standard line is the international community demands that Iran give up its nuclear programs. Who's the international community? Uh, well, the term international community, again, comes straight out of Orwell. It means the United States and whoever happens to agree with it. That's the international community. Uh, what about the world? Uh, <laughs> I mean, there happens to be a world out there. You know, this is a pretty insular country, but you can't deny its existence. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, the non-aligned countries, G77, they're called, the old non-aligned countries, that's large majority of the world's population. Now, they had their uh, regular meeting in Tehran a couple of years ago, and they once again vigorously supported Iran's right to develop nuclear power as a signer of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Well, why shouldn't they have that right? Now, in the United States, the standard line about Iran is it's the greatest threat to world peace. As Netanyahu said, it's aggressive, uh, violent, wants to conquer the world, and so on. You know, Iran, there are a lot of things wrong with Iran. You know, not my favorite place by any means. Mm -hmm. But is it aggressive? Which, where is aggressive taking place? There are actually two countries in, that are very aggressive in that region. One, of course, is the United States, uh, carrying out aggression all the time. The other is Israel, uh, which has invaded Lebanon five times, is occupied, you know. It's, uh, and uh, uh, what, is, what is the actual concern about, ir and of course, Israel has a huge nuclear weapons uh, capacity, probably hundreds of nuclear weapons. What is the actual concern about Iranian nuclear weapons? Uh, the standard talk is, well, if Iran has nuclear weapons, it's going to destroy Israel, it's going to attack the United States, it's going to conquer the world. I mean, anyone with a gray cell functioning, including every intelligence agency, knows that if Iran had nuclear weapons and even tried to load a missile, the country would be vaporized. You know? period. And whatever you think about the ruling clerics, they've given no indication of being suicidal, of wanting to lose everything they have. Actually, U.S. intelligence has explained publicly the threat of Iranian nuclear weapons, publicly. There are regular reports to Congress on the global security situation. It's all public. Uh, what they've pointed out is that uh, Iran's strategic doctrine is defensive mm -hmm. for understandable reasons if you look at the surround. They have low military expenditures even by standards of the region and their strategic doctrine is tr to try to uh, 
prevent an attack long enough for diplomacy to begin to operate. Uh, they add that if Iran is attempting to develop nuclear weapons, which no one knows, it would be part of their deterrent strategy. Now, the United States and Israel cannot tolerate a deterrent. If there's a deterrent, you cannot use force and violence freely. I think that's the heart of the matter. Is there a solution to this? Yeah, several possible solutions. So, for example, in a couple of years ago, 2010, uh, there was an agreement reached between uh, Iran, Turkey, and Brazil, in which, under which Iran would transfer its low-enriched uranium to Turkey, and in return, the Western powers would provide uh, the radioactive isotopes for, for Iran's uh, uh, medical reactors and so on. Uh, that agreement, as soon as that agreement was reached, there was a bitter attack here by the government and the press against Brazil and Turkey for, uh, for uh, implementing this agreement. The foreign minister of Brazil was kind of upset about it, and he released a letter from President Obama to the president of Brazil proposing this, presumably because they assumed Iran would never accept and it would be a propaganda weapon. Well, they accepted. What do we do? We bitterly denounce them for breaking ranks, accepting, and so on. And uh, there were all kind of pretexts offered, but they didn't amount to much. A couple of years later, 2012, December 2012, there was to be a meeting in Helsinki to, imp to carry forward a program that was initiated by the Arab states in the early 90s to try to impose a nuclear weapons-free zone in the region. There's enormous international support for that, a support so strong that the United States, England, and others kind of formally agree, but they say, you know, not right now. Uh, this uh, meeting was an attempt to carry it forward. It's under UN auspices. Uh, Israel said they wouldn't attend the meeting. Uh, the next question is, what's Iran going to do? If Iran said it would attend the meeting without preconditions. A couple of days later, Obama canceled the meetings. This was barely even mentioned in the U.S. press. Try to find it. Uh, the meetings did go on, but uh, only with uh, non-governmental organizations. If the U.S. is not going to take part, nothing is going to happen. Well, this might or might not work, but it might work. That's the point. Now, why is the U.S. opposed to it? Because Israel would have to give up its nuclear weapons, and the U.S. is not willing to agree to that. But that, these are possible answers to a manufactured crisis. Again, it's not that Iran is a nice place. You know, a lot of things wrong there, although incidentally, by the standards of our allies, it's pretty regressive. Compared with, say, Saudi Arabia, it looks like a free and open society. Uh, but uh, so, so this is by no means supportive of Iran's clerical quasi-dictatorship. But, it, but the fact of the matter is that uh, there are potential solutions which are within reach but are not being discussed. And the reason, I think, goes back to what the U.S. intelligence reports. The U.S. and Israel are unwilling to accept the possibility, it's a remote possibility, but some possibility of a deterrent. The chances are, if you try to guess what Iran's probably trying to do, we of course don't know, but the chances are that they're probably trying to develop uh, what's sometimes called nuclear capability. That is the capability to produce nuclear weapons if they decide to do it. There are many countries in the world that have that capability. And conceivably, not implausibly, they may be trying to do the same thing. It wouldn't be surprising if you look at the region they're surrounded by nuclear weapon states. The United States, of course, uh, Israel, uh, Pakistan, India. Uh, they're, in, uh, they're in an environment of uh, extreme threat. And the conflicts with Iran now are reaching a level which is almost surreal. Take a look at Iraq. Uh, 
Uh, the United States, uh, its main enemy in Iraq is supposed to be ISIS. Who's fighting ISIS? Iran. You know, Iran is backing the government of Iraq. It's providing the military support, the training, the arms, and so on to uh, pr try to press ISIS out of its recent conquests. In fact, the Iraqi military, the Iraqi leadership is saying openly, thanking Iran and saying the U.S. isn't helping us. You know, well, if you really want to eliminate ISIS, you're going to cooperate with the people who are doing it. Iran is the one state that's doing it. There's also uh, fighters on the ground who happen to be on the U.S. terrorist list, the PKK, the, uh, the Kurds. Kurdish based. Uh, these, these uh, Patrick Coburn, one of the fabulous, a very great important correspondent. Yes. Yeah. He, what he's pointed out is that uh, U.S. policy says comes straight out of Alice in Wonderland. We're refusing to cooperate with the people who are fighting our enemy, and, and in fact, we're attacking them. Well, you've, you've spent the better part of 60 years now suggesting U.S. policy had a Alice in Wonderland component to it. And as we circle around here, and, and I think probably most people in the room would, be, would love it if we sat up here for another three or four hours, but you have, you've just flown all the way from South America to be with us, so we're, we're over our time limit. But I did want to ask you, you've been so consistent and very consistent for a very, very long time in your assessment of a whole host of, of domestic and, and international issues. And if I'm right about it, because I interviewed you some years ago about this, a lot of it roots back to your, your youth. And you used to hang out at your uncle's newsstand. Your, your political education came in New York City at a newsstand, where I'm sure the nation was prominently displayed. Seven, uh, 72nd and Broadway. 72nd <laughs> and Broadway. But this was, this is, tell us about, about where this started. Well, I was a kid. I was I, you're about 10, 11. 11, 12 yeah, years yeah. old. But uh, one of the first things I learned at the newsstand is that there's a newspaper in New York, which you probably never heard of. It's called the News and Mirror. Mm -hmm. um, the way I knew that is that when people came out, it was at a subway station. When people came out of the subway station racing out, they asked for the News and Mirror. And I handed them two tabloids. Uh, later, I discovered it's two newspapers, the news and the mirror. <laughs> but, 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 but I also... This is the beginning of your study of linguistics? Beginning of yeah. my political education. Yeah. The next part was to notice that as they took the news and mirror, first thing they did is open to the racing forms. Mm -hmm. So I got some insight into society. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is that there were... Uh, uh, my uncle was a very interesting person. He'd never gone past fourth grade. At, a very edu self-educated, very intelligent, very perceptive person, uh, long story. But he attracted around the newsstand uh, uh, emigres who were, this was the late 30s, early 40s, who were coming from uh, Europe, you know, so German psychiatrists, other people. And there were interesting discussions going on, which mm -hmm. as a child I listened to. Meanwhile, at the same time, I was hanging out in uh, uh, anarchist offices and Union Square, bookstores, and Fourth the Avenue. Yiddish newspapers. No longer, yeah. yeah uh, Freie Arbeiterstimme was there. And uh, there, were, there were, again, uh, refugees coming, uh, a lot of them Spanish refugees, Spanish anarchists. And I, le I learned a lot from that. That's one part of my education. You've been pretty consistent on <laughs> keeping a lot of those values alive in our discourse at a time where to suggest that you might be a libertarian socialist is not necessarily... Uh, something that every major reporter understands. Uh, Libertarian socialism is just the traditional name for anarchism, yeah. left-wing left -wing anarchism. The yeah. United States, the term libertarian in the United States has a different meaning than it had in traditionally very different meaning. Yeah. It's very anti-libertarian. Mm -hmm. So you're telling me Rand Paul is not, uh, not really putting it all uh, together. You take a look at American-style libertarianism. It's basically adv advocacy of private tyranny. The, not that the people say it or even believe it, but if you think about the policies, that's what it ends up being. And the number one question that people asked, and it actually, it is, it's genuinely democratic. They get to vote, and they vote a question up the ladder, and 
So far, there's no ad campaign advertising, so it's reasonably legit, I think. The number one question they asked you, they, they all know you. They, well, they, there was actually, somebody asked whether, whether you had a favorite, uh, having grown up in Philadelphia, whether you had a favorite uh, Philly cheesesteak. Uh, <laughs> but the number one question was, Noam, you've been at this political commentary for a very long time. Have you got, ever gotten anything wrong in your interpretation? Uh, and if so, have you ever publicly admitted as much? Uh -huh. And a somewhat related question, what are the two most important subjects that you have changed your mind on, and what prompted you to do so? Pretty long question, but yeah. it's an no, interesting... Pl plenty of mistakes. Yeah. The usual mistake, which happens over and over, is getting involved in things too late. It's a serious mistake. So take, say, what we were talking about before, global warming. Mm -hmm. Time to get involved in that was the 1970s. Mm -hmm. uh, by the 1970s, it was already, be I remember very well when the two friends, one who was head of earth sciences at Harvard, the other head of meteorology at MIT, both around the same time, uh, came with very gloomy countenances. They were getting information indicating that the effect of uh, at the anthrop human con contributions to uh, carbon dioxide uh, uh, concentrations in the atmosphere were reaching severe proportions. Uh, I didn't do anything. Very few people did anything. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until years later that uh, I and others became seriously involved at the point when it's a real crisis. All right, that's a bad mistake. The same is true of the Vietnam War, for example. I was very much involved in yeah. anti-war activism but, and resistance and so on, but from the early 60s, and the time to become involved was 1950. That's when the policies were set that led to this destruction. Uh, I could go over case after case. Uh, the general error, at least my own, when I look back, is just not getting involved sufficiently when it matters. Is that the underpinning of your great essay on the responsibility of, a, of an intellectual? Do you know where that talk was? That was, like most of my articles, that was a talk. Mm -hmm. It'll surprise you to find out where it was given, to the Harvard Hillel Association. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is before 1967, when everything changed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So much has changed, but for so many years you have been a remarkable voice and one that, that people have, many people have disagreed with you. You never seem to mind it when people disagree with you. Oh. You like the debate, you like the yeah. argument. Well, often they're right. <laughs> <laughs> but also many people have learned to look at media, politics, economics, and society in fundamentally different ways. And as a person who's been involved in media reform for an awfully long time, I can tell you that a month ago, when the media reform movement in this country succeeded in getting the FCC, the Federal That's Communications important. Commission, that was really to protect important. net neutrality and to protect the internet That's itself, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was a very I think an awfully lot of them, I, I believe almost every activist who came to every rally was carrying a copy of Manufacturing Consent. Hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, Noam Chomsky. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.